Well, I won't keep you all waiting. Uh, thanks for coming. Happy Earth Day. I'm Carolyn Merrick, Program Coordinator here at the Center, and it's my pleasure to introduce Community, I'm going to get it right, Community Climate Collaborative, or as I like to say it, C3, because it's, it's easier. easier. It's easier. <laughs> we have Susan Cruz, the Executive Director with us today, and she's going to talk about riding climate solutions, how improving local transit can help us reach our climate goals. So Susan, thanks for coming, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Great, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here, uh, especially on Earth Day. Uh, there's nothing I'd rather do than talk to a bunch of folks about how we can reduce our impact on Earth Day. And I'm grateful to have you all here. I, there's definitely some, some familiar names. Uh, hello, Marsha, I just wanna say hi. Um, and so I really wanna to talk to you a little bit about transit today. It's not a topic that is frequently discussed on Earth Day, but it probably should be. So I'm just gonna share my screen a little and so we can get started. But since we're a small group, I'm hoping that we can um, have it be a, more of a conversation. All right, there we go. So everybody can see my screen. Great, thank you. Well, as Carolyn said, my name is Susan Cruz and I am the Executive Director of the Community Climate Collaborative and I'm really grateful to be here with the Center. The Center is one of our partner organizations at the Community Climate Collaborative and um, stay tuned for some exciting announcements in the coming weeks about how the Center and other businesses are really uh, stepping forward to lead on climate. So today, uh, I think we'll just talk a little bit about, many of you know a little bit about C3, but there's a few who may not. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who we are, why we, um, are, why we were formed, why we do the work we do, and uh, how, talk about addressing transportation emissions in our community, and how you can get involved and be a voice for climate solutions. Wherever you are, that's where you need to start taking action on climate. And C3 is an organization that is here to meet you there. That means, of course, action in your home, action at your school, action in your community, your business, or it could also mean wherever you are in your experience from someone who's just getting engaged in climate and doesn't know where to begin or a seasoned advocate. We are here uh, to help you be a part of Climate Solutions. Every day we talk at C3, we talk to people about taking climate action. Everyone uh, has a different motivation for why they might get involved. You might be motivated to save money for, on your energy costs, or uh, you might be passionate about climate justice or the protection of the natural world. You might be thinking about future generations, your children or your grandchildren. As I do, um, I think about uh, the climate goal we've set for our community, reduce emissions by uh, 2030 and reach carbon neutrality by 2025, 2050. And I think about the fact that my son will be around my age by the time we hit 2050. And I hope that um, we've done enough to reduce emissions for him by, by that time. What's different about C3 is that because we are focused on collaborative solutions, no matter your why, no matter why you're involved, you will have a seat at the table as we design solutions for our community. We believe the more individual action you take, the more you are ready to advocate and grow, advocate and grow into climate leadership. We, so we invest a significant amount of resources at our organization into engagement, including on the policy side. Without small and increasingly larger actions coming from all sectors of our community, we will not reach our climate goals. By investing in engagement, we are also expanding the choir and redefining climate leadership to include more members of our community. This is our wonderful team that I'm fortunate to work with. And if you get involved with C3, you may meet some of these wonderful folks. Um, Terry Kent, our Director of Communications. Caetano de Campos Lopez is our Director of Climate Policy and is currently doing a lot of research for us on transit solutions. Erica Gaines, uh, highlighted in blue, is our Operations and Engagement Manager. She's highlighted because she was just recently promoted to that position. She's been with us for two years. 
and Claire Habel, our commercial program manager, and Latricia Giles. I think she spoke to you all or spoke to the center just a few weeks ago. She's our new residential climate and equity program manager, new to our team. So I also want to present to you uh, this piece of information, which is uh, often we think about climate change as something that is happening far away and is not happening right here in our community. Something that's happening where sea level is rising or fires are occurring. But this is actually a slide that includes the average annual temperature for right here in Charlottesville, Virginia. For, from 1895 on the left-hand side to 2018 on the right-hand side. Each stripe is a year and the bluer the stripes are cooler than average normal temperatures for that year. And the red stripes are warmer than average temperatures for that year. So when we think about um, the rising temperatures that even that we're experiencing right here in this community, it's clear with the trend where we're headed and we, of course, need to think about who might be impacted by those rising temperatures. And it is um, more vulnerable members of the community around us, elderly women uh, and children, uh, low-income communities who have little ability to mitigate rising temperatures through energy efficiency or renewable energy or rising energy costs for that matter. And so climate change, uh, when we think about it as C3, we're thinking about how to create solutions that don't just lower our emissions, but also ease the burden of the reality that of warming temperatures for all members of our community. So the IP, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us in order to prevent the most catastrophic impacts of climate change, we need to reduce our emissions by 45% by 2030 and reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Communities around the Commonwealth and across the nation are responding by setting their own goals to reduce emissions. Right here in Charlottesville and Albemarle County, we have set leadership goals aligned with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The Commonwealth of Virginia now has its own goal uh, to reach carbon neutrality by 2045, which communities will need to support. And President Biden recently announced his goal to reduce carbon emissions by 50% by 2030. So it's more ambitious than many of these goals that are currently laid out before us. 88% of Virginians live in urban and suburban communities. This is where the people are. And we all need to do our part to reach these goals. And we actually have the power right here in our communities to do so. Here's a, here's a graphic that demonstrates where emissions are coming from in our community. And you'll see that transportation, which is what we're talking about today, is 26.6% uh, of emissions for the city of Charlottesville and 48% of the emissions for Albemarle County. So unless we figure out ways to reduce our emissions from transportation, we're not going to reach our climate goals. I also always, it's always really important to me to point out on this slide, the slice of the pie um, labeled municipal. Those are the amount of emissions by our local government. So even if our local government set out an ambitious path to make their governmental operations carbon neutral, put solar on every building that they had, we would only reduce our emissions by 5%. So we all need to do our part uh, to reduce emissions. Every business, every school, every home. Um, and those of us who can do more need to do more to support those who can't. So one, one, one way I wanna get into the topic talking about transportation, and you might be surprised that I'm gonna talk about building energy for a minute, but I think it's relevant uh, to help you understand why we're uh, putting an emphasis on transit in our solutions. A couple of summers ago, uh, pre-COVID, C3 went to Southwood's uh, Trailer Park's Back to School Festival, uh, a largely immigrant trailer park community. And we asked the community this question, we asked, this is actually the paper from that event where we asked residents how much they spent in energy and they're on their energy in their homes each month. 
And we were quite surprised by the responses from the community demonstrating that many members of Southwood were paying nearly $500 a month in energy costs. Some actually um, put it at 500, but said they actually pay more than that. Um, we sort of put an artificial ceiling on this scale, but the vast majority were well over $300 per month for a trailer. Now, I don't know what your home energy bill is like, but mine is not anywhere close to that. And my home is significantly larger than a trailer. So this is what we call energy burden. The portion of a household's income that is spent on energy. Anything that is greater than 6% is considered to be unsustainable energy costs. If you're spending more than 6% of your family's income on energy, you're probably going to struggle with paying your bills and keeping your housing affordable. One quarter of all households in the city of Charlottesville bear unsustainable energy costs. We did some research we released last summer on Charlottesville's energy burden. We hope in the next year to be able to do a similar uh, report for Albemarle County. Um, so that's one quarter of the households in our community have trouble paying their energy bills. So if we take Southwood, for example, there are 350 trailers at Southwood let's assume those residents are paying, let's be, let's be um, conservative. Let's say they're spending $250 a month, which is still far more than I pay in energy for my home. That's $1 million a year in energy costs from one of the most uh, vulnerable communities in our, in our area. It is also, 3,644 tons of carbon per year. So if we want to reduce emissions from the residential sector, we need to make sure we're lowering energy costs in these households where energy bills are very high, we can have a more significant impact in our reductions and also achieve a simultaneous community goal of making uh, housing more affordable and more stable. So let's translate that to the transportation sector. This is my old um, 1998 Toyota Corolla. Uh, so I had that car for a very long time, only recently uh, had to let it go. So um, now we're down to one car and we're trying to save up until I can get an electric vehicle. But this was uh, the car that I drove for a long time. So transportation is the second largest expense for families. An average family, average amount spent by a middle income family is around 20% of income on transportation costs. And only about a quarter of that is spent on fuel. So, you know, most in middle income, most people are paying those transportation costs on car payments. Right? They've purchased a, a vehicle and they're making a car payment and a quarter of that amount is spent on fuel. The average amount spent by a low income family is 30% of income on transportation and the vast majority of that is on fuel costs. Car payments are not something that low income families can typically sustain. And so those fuel costs are just exorbitant for these families. If you want to take it down into miles per gallon and how much how efficient cars are, a vehicle at 35 miles per gallon versus a vehicle at 25 or 20 miles per gallon is a $916 difference per year in cost. So the more income you have, the more you're able to buy a more efficient newer vehicle, the fewer carbon emissions you have and the less it's going to cost you the carbon savings from a 35 mile, miles per gallon car versus a 20 miles per gallon is about 2.6 metric tons of carbon per year. And so if you extrapolated that out into the hundreds or thousands of residents, you begin to see where it would be good to not only solve a community issue of access uh, to transit and ridership, and if we're gonna create more transit riders, 
having a focus on service to our underserved communities or communities who need to reach destinations to work and get kids to school, go to doctors, go to community centers. That's where uh, we believe their focus needs to be. So this is exactly what we're researching right now. We have a transit and equity study underway. Um, and we're essentially looking at the benefits, the economic, social impact, and climate benefits of expanding transit ridership with a focus on equity. And the purpose of this research is to A, make the case that I was just trying to make very briefly, uh, but more in depth with a lot more data and statistics that by expanding transit ridership in this way, we will decrease our transportation emissions a lot faster than if we just expand transit ridership generally. If you're taking a rider who owns a hybrid vehicle or an electric vehicle or a more fuel efficient vehicle and putting them on a bus, that's great because we're getting fewer cars off the road. Asphalt also creates carbon emissions, just so everyone knows. Roads aren't great, parking lots aren't great for climate. Uh, also creates urban heat islands, which can be dangerous climate impacts. Um, so it's great to get people, no matter what, out of their cars and onto buses, but it is also, um, you're gonna reduce emissions less quickly with a focus on middle and upper incomes uh, reaching transit than you are of lower income communities. So our research, through our research, uh, we want to make that case. We also want to under, uncover barriers to mobility that our community is experiencing. We conducted a community-wide survey. I've uh, got about 300 responses, which is not bad for a community survey. And we conducted a series of focus groups with the last couple wrapping up this week and early next week. Uh, one focus group, you can see um, this uh, graphic here on the left, um, our partner, Sin Barreras, uh, helped us put together a focus group at all in Spanish. Uh, we had a resident tell us during that focus group that um, they live near Core Brothers and the closest bus stop for them would require them to cross 29 North um, and did not feel safe doing so. And so this is just uh, an issue in our community we need to address and these focus groups are really helpful in order to be able for C3 to tell these real life stories of barriers that people are facing to transportation. And we will release our final report on this topic in June. So there's a lot more digging we need to do and a lot more research. So be on the lookout for that report in June. And um, one of the other things that we wanna do with it, and we're hopeful that this community survey and focus groups will tell us is what are the community, what recommendations do we wanna to make to local transit systems for how to improve it? So we hope to not only research the economic, um, social impact and climate case for transit expansion with a focus on equity, but also make some recommendations. Um, and that's part of the community survey and focus groups. What does the community wanna see in terms of change with transit? And then we can make those recommendations to local decision makers. So it will really be a two part report. So be on the lookout for that. Expected benefits of expanded transit with a focus on equity. Of course, it provides accessible, affordable, and reliable public transportation, uh, which we all need. It benefits residents of communities of color and low-income households that must travel to obtain better jobs um, and secure educational opportunities and get good quality health care. Um, housing, affordable housing is an issue in our community and distance that folks have to travel to have secure uh, job opportunities is just really critical and being able to rely on transit rather than a, a, an unreliable old car um, with high fuel costs to get there is a substantial improvement. We'll also reduce our transportation energy burden levels, um, potentially reducing vehicle miles traveled in our community, which is really important. And when we're thinking about infrastructure costs and repairs, the fewer um, miles of car travel that we're generating, the fewer infrastructure repairs and costs that we will have. Um, C3 also, we um, just, just throwing this in here because it's also a transportation issue while not transit. This year, uh, we worked with Diantha, thank you very much, um, 
at Albemarle County and uh, eight other localities representing more than 1 million Virginians in support of legislation that was before um, the General Virginia General Assembly for clean cars to put to tie um, the Commonwealth to improved vehicle emission standards. Mm -hmm. And we it was great to be able to work in coalition with these communities. You can see here uh, Mayor LeVar Stoney of Richmond tweeting a copy of our letter and um, allowing these localities to step into climate leadership and advocate for a bill that ultimately successfully passed in the General Assembly, which will help our community lower its transportation emissions from cars. Next year, we're hoping maybe there'll be some transit legislation we can back. So C3, um, you know, we, I, as I mentioned, we do a lot of community engagement, a lot of talking with folks, including on the policy side with our focus groups and community surveys. Um, but we also do sign on letters and recommendations. And um, so if you sign, sign up with our organization, you can be a part of those actions that we take. We participated heavily in Albemarle County's climate action planning process and submitted a letter uh, of support for the legislation. And we submitted a letter with some recommendations that were ultimately included by the wonderful county staff who led the effort. Um, and we're proud of Albemarle County's Climate Action Plan. And we're looking forward to the next phase of their process. They're gonna be um, releasing their emissions inventory here sometime soon and uh, getting into phase two of climate action planning. And we hope, we're hopeful that Charlottesville's climate action planning process will resume again soon. As an organization, our impact is growing. Um, you see, look, there's a lovely photo over here on the left. And I don't know if you all know where that is, but it is the roof over Carolyn's head. Um, this is the solar installation at the center. And we're very proud of the action they have taken to reduce their emissions at their new facility. Um, and looking forward to, uh, you know, C3 is just working with so many great um, local governments, with local businesses and schools. When I leave you this afternoon, I'm actually headed over to Walker Upper Elementary to deliver 400 climate kits to four, fifth graders for Earth, Earth Day one of which is my own fifth grader. So I'm excited to do that when I leave you here today at four o'clock. So we need you. We need you to be a part of these solutions, to be a part of um, advocacy for climate at the local level. Um, as Barack Obama said, we are the first generation to feel the impacts of climate change and the last generation who can do something about it. So we hope that you will go to our website and sign up at theclimatecollaborative.org backslash one voice. Uh, if you do so, you will receive newsletters and updates from our organization. You can learn about ways to reduce your impact. You can add your voice to policy advocacy. Actually by signing up, we have a mechanism where we will automatically add your name to C3 policy letters and recommendations to local government. We will email you before each letter goes out to give you a chance to opt out to make sure that this is something that you truly support, but you can sign on and be automatically added. Um, and of course, you can always support the work of C3. Um, we've got more, more and more people are ready to take action. It is a wonderful thing in our community, how many people we are talking to and working with businesses, households, schools. Um, but, you know, we're often spread thin and we need to make sure there's a, a C3 uh, person there to answer the call when people need help. So by supporting us, you can uh, help make sure that happens. So I'm going to take questions, but I just want to put this up for a minute. Um, and I'm actually hoping there are questions in case you need uh, any of this information. Uh, I'm hoping our, our questions can be more of a conversation. I would love to hear your impressions of transit in our community and things you think need to be improved. So I'll stop sharing so we can have more of a face-to-face -face conversation. It's lovely to see you all. And everyone, um, if you want to speak, you can unmute yourself. If you don't know how, you can wave madly, and I'll try to do it for you. Um, 
I see that um, somebody had asked before yeah. where buses fit into the pie chart. Buses are actually municipal transport emissions. So they were pre they're a pretty small amount in terms of their individual emissions. The community transport slice is really are all of our driving. Municipal emissions for transportation are, are, are even tinier than municipal government. All right, and I see um, Peter asking how accessibility to bus stops fit this discussion. Having benches and shelters and safe on broken sidewalks to get to and from bus stops, absolutely. Um, that is certainly something we are gonna be talking about in our report. One of the, the things um, that many people notice about public transportation is the nicer, the, the sort of wealthier the neighborhood, the nicer the bus stop is. And um, the lower the income of the neighborhood, the um, more broken or less protected um, the bus stop is. I don't know that that's necessarily true in Charlottesville, um, where you know that may come out in our report. But that is something that is generally noted of transit systems, sort of universally across the country. Susan, can I make yeah. a comment? Yes, please. Um, as many of the people on this screen probably know. Our transit system, CAT, is owned by Charlottesville. Uh, it is the Charlottesville uh, transit system. Albemarle County does not have any ownership. Um, one of the things that we are working right now with CAT and with Virginia Department of Transportation is around shelters and concrete pads on, on the Albemarle County bus stops. The reason that Albemarle County doesn't have any shelters or actually concrete pads in many places for our riders is because there has never been a memorandum of understanding, a contract between CAT and VDOT around right of ways. There's no way to put a shelter on a VDOT road in Albemarle County right now. We are working behind, have been working for, I don't know, months to get that contract in place. It's not a contract that involves Albemarle County. We're just trying to negotiate that work. And it's interesting because at the Regional Transit Partnership meeting at four o'clock this afternoon, CAD is going to give us a presentation on, on updates around this infrastructure piece. So I'm pretty excited about this work. <laughs> hey, I'm excited to hear about it. We need shelters, right? We, and I understand we can't have a shelter everywhere, but there are critical places in Almar County and in, Ca in the city probably, but certainly in Almar County where we need bus shelters. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I look forward to hearing from you about what you learned in that update because I'm, I agree. I think it's something that really needs to happen. Uh, you know, I've I've certainly I've been at my bus stop is uh, Rio and Greenbrier, um, and only recently I'm really grateful that Albemarle County put in um, crosswalk with um, walk walking signs at that intersection because it was fine. I would drop my son off at Greenbrier Elementary and then I'd walk to the bus stop uh, and wait for the Route 11. Um, and it was on this, my side of Rio Road. But when I got dropped off in the evening, mm -hmm. I would get dropped off on the opposite side. And during the winter time, it's dark and the cars are, that's a kind of a wild intersection with the gas stations and uh, it, it often felt treacherous crossing uh, that street to get back home, uh, taking the bus. And that was just something that I experienced as a rider um, of local transit. And I have, the buses are great, the buses are clean, the bus drivers are kind, um, but uh, the, the infrequency and the, the safety at the bus stops was definitely a concern of mine. Well, and it is great, Susan. I will say to everybody that the prototype that we have picked for the shelters are lit, so they have lights, which is lovely. <laughs> yes. Great. Yeah. Well, Susan, one thing I was really heartened to see is that um, CAD is going to be fare free for the next three years. I think that is a big deal for just for so many reasons. For one thing, mm -hmm. it makes hesitant riders much more, you know, willing to give it a try because you don't have to understand how the thing works you just get on right and so yeah. i was really really happy to see that 
we need to figure out how to make that permanent, not just three years, but that's. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a big push. I know C3 just signed on to a statewide transit um, justice letter to governors Warner and Kane talking about um, not just investing in buses, but also just general operations for transit systems to so that they can make the choice, the decisions they need to make to improve their systems. One of the things C3 advocated for um, at the the budget session right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so it was not great timing for us to be asking for anything financial from the city of Charlottesville, but it was like March of 2020 um, was uh, improved increase in the amount of salaried employees at CAT. Um, CAT has a, a large number of temporary workers and so if those workers get a better offer on the day uh, for pay, they will probably take it, which means that, which is completely understandable, which means that bus doesn't run and there are no riders that day. And so um, increasing the number of salaried uh, workers, well-paid salaried workers at CAT will actually improve our ability to deliver uh, reliable transit. And I, that's one thing that was in this letter in addition to improving bus stops and uh, busing infrastructure, increasing frequency, making sure we're paying the workforce that is dr are driving the buses and um, investing in operations, not just uh, also electrification of buses, but making sure we've got the infrastructure there to support that change. Yes, Virginia, I um, think you'll have to, un oh yeah, you're unmuted. I think I've unmuted. Yes, you did. Um, the two things, uh, I know, if I understand it, the cat is now letting people ride the bus for free. Yes, that is correct. Needs to be promoted widely and loudly and and very frequently. And the other thing is the business about uh, bus stops on Twenty Nine. Now we have we are putting up this um, homeless shelter or homeless homes for the homeless across 29 just um, north of Greenbrier. Now <laughs> I don't know exactly where the bus stops are on 29 there but I certainly think that's something that should be coordinated. I don't know who would, who would do that but I think it's something to consider. I know it's an ongoing process because they're renovating a lot of that but mm -hmm. Um, those don't necessarily apply to me, but I just, I just think about other people in that way. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think we often make, um, that's one of the, the, um, issues around that we try to solve is like multi-solving, right? Um, you know, we don't want to make decisions about climate in a vacuum. We also um, need to make sure that other decisions being made have those considerations, right? If we can elevate the, the need for transit as, as an equity issue in our community, then when uh, folks are thinking about um, that, that hotel that was purchased to, to house um, homeless members, home, members of our home community who are homeless, um, that, that is just sort of great. I, and I have no idea if there's a bus shelter there, but I took note of that. I think it's a, it's a great comment. It's also um, getting across, it, it's pretty far away from the traffic light at Greenbrier and it's considerably far away from, I forget what they call this shopping center up here, but across from the, the Fashion Square. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There. And those are the only two traffic lights. Mm -hmm. Virginia, you're right. And we've been talking about both of those issues and we talked about that. And we've been talking about that. You're exactly right. It's a, it's a that, huge problem. We've got to solve the, it. The problem that was addressed earlier or mentioned earlier is on 29, if you're on the Route 7, is you're on one side of the road going south and the other side going north. And clearly, if you're trying to go somewhere in between, you need to have access to both sides. So being able to get across 29, which is impossible almost everywhere, Mm -hmm. would be uh, nice to be able yeah. to do that. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be an issue. I mean, that, that's sort of how CAT runs is sort of one oh. side of the road on the way 
and the other side of the road on the way back. And so it just, it presents a, a challenge that we're going to have to solve for as a community. I mean, we're a growing community. I don't think that as some people might not want us to want us to stop growing, but I don't think that is going to happen. And we're going to need to begin to invest in transit solutions um, so that we can serve a growing community. I'm curious um, if folks, if there's ever been feedback at the center, I don't mean to put Peter on the spot, but um, from your community of hearing about transit needs and what folks experience is. Uh, yeah, thanks, Susan. And thank you for being here and for all of C3's work and, and serving as a resource for folks like the center. Uh, we do have a demand for uh, public bus transit and we are waiting for the city to uh, loosen some more of its COVID restrictions. Um, they have pledged to add a bus stop at the center right at our front door. <clears throat> and we invested about $50,000 of our own funds or community funds that we raised to allow the parking lot, um, you know, to be, to, to handle the big buses. It's not, a, you can't just have a, a bus run through anything without cheering up your parking lot. So we invested in that. So we expect that to happen as soon as the city, um, uh, loosens its restrictions. Uh, and that was an important consideration when we identified a property for the new center. Um, we couldn't find anything that was on a current bus stop, but the Route 11 was in the works at that time. And we felt that there would be uh, the ability to uh, Route 11 just jumping into our parking lot and then going back on the route. So that will be happening uh, soon, but it's part of what prompted my question is people say it's that's fine and you'll have a shelter over um, the bus stop and you'll have place to sit at the bus stop because a lot of older adults can't stand at a bus stop for five, 10 or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. They just can't stand that long. And that's even on a nice day. And then you throw in rain or heat and whatnot, it becomes a real big bear. And then we do hear the, the feedback a lot about um, even if I can deal with those issues, I can, there's not a complete sidewalk for me to walk from my house to the stop. A lot of stops, there's no sidewalk at all. And we don't know, but Diantha knows we uh, are working with our partners at Charlottesville Area Alliance to uh, try to do a, an inventory, not just of bus stops but, and shelters, but how accessible they are. Um, particularly for people with mobility issues, which a lot of older adults have. So uh, I'll follow Robert, up. With I would what, love to know the results of that. That's amazing. Yeah, we, Thank we, you for doing uh, that research. We're, we're, we think we can do it. It's going to be involved, but I think we can get the people power and maybe partners like C3 to, to help us with that. Because our theory is what you stated earlier is not only are there problems, but the likelihood is that the bigger problems are in the most needy area. Mm -hmm. uh, with Mary Coleman of City of Promise yesterday, and we talked about that, and she said, yes, I'm glad you brought it up. It's absolutely an issue in a lot of the neighborhoods um, that they're focusing on at 10th and Page, West Haven, uh, and Star Hill, that those um, bus stops are um, all but worthless because of the reasons we've, we've mentioned. So it's a, a very big need for um, anecdotally, we've not done a survey, but anecdotally, um, center users do need that and a lot of folks are talking of you know today I can drive but I want to be prepared for the day that I don't drive either because I can't afford it um, I can't do it physically or just for environmental reasons I no longer want to drive I'd rather use the public transit mm -hmm. well if you are coordinating a survey and you need a call for volunteers I would be more than happy to post you know, a call for volunteers to get people out looking at all the bus stops, assign people survey responsibilities. Um, yeah, I think that would be a great thing. I think Latricia would probably love to help with that. So please keep us posted and let us know. Yeah, um, I remember when I was, uh, I worked at the Legal Aid Justice Center for 10 years. And um, when we were, and I was there when we were storing the Charles B. Holt Rock House, which is Right next to the Legal Aid Justice Center, um, we the bus stop that was there was terrible. And we were like, oh my goodness, we're going to restore this beautiful old historic home. And there's going to be this, this awful bus stop in front of it. So we actually paid to restore, you know, do stonework around the bus stop. So it blended in with, no, it doesn't have a shelter, but so it would blend in with the historic home. 
um, and looked like it was part of it too. And so it was sort of a way of bringing the modern in with the historic and, and those, those actions happen a lot of people, um, you know, improving their local bus stop. And it would be great to have a survey of access to those and quality of protection of those. Bus stop might, might be. What if, try, try the system of adopt a bus. Stop. I am you. Why do I keep? No, you're, you're good. good. I hear you. Yeah, adopt a bus stop. Instead of adopt a road, adopt a bus stop. I love that. There was one near Washington Park that was decorated in flowers recently that I observed on Twitter. Uh, somebody put like, I don't know if they, it was like a, after a wedding or, uh, but they put all the flowers from something all around this bus stop. I thought it was. Actually, I'm working on an art project around bus shelters, right? And I'm going to start with the two shelters at Stonefield because they're on private property. <laughs> but I hope with Gar, I've been working with Garland from CAT and we hope to roll out that art project throughout the community at some point, but first we have to get more shelters. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, my question was about um, buy-in, uh, specifically when you talked about the unsustainable energy burden mm -hmm. of folks who really can't afford it. Right. So you, you as a community organization were surprised to see that $500 or more. You, this is your line of work. Mm -hmm. For someone like me, who it isn't the line of work, I'm probably more astonished than you are. Um, and I right away, I think, well, gee whiz, um, this is my planet, my community, my continent. If we take care of this, I don't want to, you know, this is coming from a capitalistic perspective. I'm trying to figure out a buy-in. Then I'm saving myself, mm -hmm. you know? I, I mean, is there, a, is there a way to pitch it to our community that's, uh, more palatable to those who can afford it, to, to have, you know, who don't have this energy burden to help those who do. Right. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, you know, one of the, uh, particularly around home energy burden, I think we can all um, support investing in transit um, because that is a way to reduce transportation energy burden for people and reduce emissions. So that, that's, that one's an easy one to advocate for. We're going to hopefully have some recommendations. Hopefully, there will be federal money available from Biden's infrastructure plan for transit improvement. Also, um, I think the city and the county have used CARES Act money, um, and so we'll we'll see what's available from the state and the federal government down the road. But advocating for investing in transit is absolutely something everybody can do. And um, in terms of people being able to take their own dollars and give it toward a project in uh, a, a low income to reduce energy burden in a, in a low income household. Um, I know our project partners at the Local Energy Alliance Program and Albemarle Housing, Housing Improvement Program are always doing work to improve efficiency in homes. So that is always a possibility. Uh, you know, one of the things we have to solve around residential emissions is the split landlord tenant incentive. Um, so landlord owns the home, um, the, oh, more than half of our energy burden residents are renters. So unless we figure out how to reduce uh, emissions and create more energy efficiency in rental units, we are gonna struggle um, to reduce our residential emissions. And so one of the things C3 really wants to figure out is what kind of financing mechanism can we create that would allow to solve for that? Because most of the, the state and even local money that's available for energy efficiency improvements is really focused on homeowners, um, low-income owners. And there's plenty of work to do there, lots of work to do there. Yeah, Marsha, you wanna say something? I do. Um the money that uh, that LEAP and AHIP have, well, AHIP, I don't know so much. LEAP is equally uh, available to renters as long as they get their landlord's permission. And uh, the, uh, the cap, the income caps are quite generous this year and they've got more money to do uh, uh, that they can use to do things that were not on the Dominion standard calendar uh, um, menu of uh, uh, they can replace 
uh, uh, your furnace if it's really bad, your AC. I mean, big things. Uh, uh, so I've been on a toot uh, to publicize this to the people who need it. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke to city council uh, uh, last Monday, um, knowing that the council pretty may not know about the new things, but they, their help, Charlottesville helps to subsidize LEAP, they know, but the people listening don't. And uh, son of a gun, I found out uh, that uh, somebody had live tweeted my remarks and we got, they're getting 15 more signups. And uh, yeah. Nice, that's great, so, good job. And then I, I sent the same letter off to um, Charlottesville Cares and we'll see if they want to pick up on it. We need to get through to low income households uh, who don't know what's available uh, or maybe don't believe in it. Maybe they're skeptical because the word of mouth is not working on their block. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't think funding mechanism for income limited people to get their houses uh, made much more energy efficient, efficient is the problem. It's getting people to, to know about it and use it. And LEAP is asking to hack out more clients. They, they, okay, so we need to help them. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely okay. need to get the word out. I also know that LEAP's uh, income threshold for seniors is pretty astronomical. Yeah, it's pretty high. $150,200 this year. Um, and it's half that, 75K, 75,100 for if you don't have a, somebody over 60 in your, in your household. So if you make if you make anything under that, you can get you qualify for leap service oh, in your home. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they can, can come and do an energy assessment and um, put in insulation, replace light bulbs and uh, fixtures. And um, Mark is saying they now have the ability to do furnace replacements. Yeah, Peter. Susan, um, back to transit. We talked a lot about the bus stop accessibility. Um, what other barriers do you see? To people using transit in Charlottesville Out Mall? The biggest barrier that I see is frequency. Um, and it is just uh, particularly for the work workforce community. Um, if you have to wait an hour for the next bus, if something happened and you didn't get out the door right on time, or um, you, you know, you know, for me, the the heading downtown is great. You know, I get there at eight fifteen, get on the bus, I'm downtown by nine. But then my bus home was either at four thirty or or five thirty, uh, and th there I either needed to leave work early or stay late, and it just was a real was a barrier to me um, in wanting to take the bus. But I think for people who um, need to be at a job and if they miss work, if they're late to work, um, that they could lose their job and their job is their lifeline, uh, knowing that they have to wait an hour if they miss a bus, it just, they don't feel confident enough to, or if the bus is late, um, to, to rely on it. And so they'll purchase a vehicle and, have, and get in the habit of taking that vehicle. So we really need to increase frequency in addition to bus stops and access, it's the, really the, the frequency. The buses should run on 15 to 20 minute intervals. You should, shouldn't have to wait you know, an hour for the next bus if you miss one. What also, and, and I was on the CAT advisory committee for several years and, and that certainly was one of the barriers that came up constantly. What about the, the image of public transit in our area? You know, in a big city, everybody uses the public transit. The image locally is it's only for low income people. Do you experience that or hear that? And if so, any brilliant ideas on how to address that challenge? I mean, we have been trying to improve, like we actually had a plan. I, I called this talk Riding Climate Solutions. Uh, we actually had a campaign called Driving Climate Solutions where we were putting people in an electric vehicle for the day and sharing their story. 
I really want to have a riding climate solutions where people take transit for the day and talk about their experience and what they liked about it um, and share it on social media. Um, but of course, COVID has made that um, difficult, people not really wanting to. I think probably the biggest uh, image problem that transit has right now is COVID um, and being close with other people on the bus. Uh, we've done some PSA campaigns with CAT. Um, Transit is a climate solution. C3 and CAT are both on the radio together and a public service announcement. And so you may hear that radio ad around. Um, it's, I think it's still running right now. CAT has done some great uh, social media videos um, highlighting their workers. I, I would love to have a meet the cat drivers uh, element where you can learn your bus driver. I'm, you know, Ben and I drive the route eight and um, I'm excited to see you because, you know, whatever and sort of meet the transit drivers so people can get to know their local bus drivers and just feel comfortable in those spaces. So I, yeah, I think there's a lot of work to do. I think image is, is an issue, but it's more just ease of, of getting in your car. Um, I think that's actually the bigger barrier rather than the image of public transit is just so easy to get in your car and go downtown and, you know, but the more we, you have to circle around trying to find a parking space, the more you're like, why don't I just take the bus? <laughs> so easy parking is um, a, sort of a barrier to transit expansion too. Yeah. Yes. Um, I haven't, we haven't said anything about the, these uh, little scooters as a solution for uh, the electric scooters that you can get just for the ride that you were, you know, if you're doing something infrequently and you don't need a car, um, it, uh, you have to be physically able to, um, to ride them, you have to balance and all of that. But uh, what do you think? Where does that fit in, do you think, Susan? I, um, I, I need to do more research. I have thoughts, but I'm not sure they're accurate. Um, I, you know, mostly I've seen the scooters. One thing I don't like is that they block sidewalk access. People park them on the sidewalks and then that becomes a mobility issue, a accessibility issue if they're preventing people um, from walking safely on sidewalks or people have to go into the streets because there's a scooter there. Um, I would love to see data about how many people actually used them for commuting. Uh, my, my sense is that they, they worked really well for quick, you know, quick trips, but they weren't really mm -hmm. an essential piece of replacing cars. Um, and they are, you know, batteries and charging. It's also, you know, there's some carbon intensity there and I, I'm just not sure the trade-off. I need to do more research on it. I'm not convinced, let's say, but I'm not, I'm open. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Any other thoughts? Well, you're a lovely group. I, I really appreciate it. I'm happy to stay on a few more minutes if anybody else now, has any questions. There's a, a, a link in the chat, <clears throat> CBS News. It says scooters are worse for the environment than many think. So, um, Someone else has done a little research on that. So if you want to click so, on that link before we go. Yeah, um, that's, yeah. That's my sense, Ben. Um, yeah, I, I sort of was leaning in that direction without um, actual proof, but um, thanks for that link. I also see that you've asked, um, what's the largest barrier to improving frequency? And I do think it's a capital expenditure. Um, there needs to be an increase in transit budget so more buses can be added to the fleet to, you know, we can't increase frequency with the number of buses we have right now. Well, we can, we might be able to optimize some routes and get a little bit more frequency, but I think overall there's going to need to be an increase in buses. So it was a number of decades ago, I rode buses and streetcars in Washington, D.C. to school and back. And the difference between buses in big cities and buses in this particular area is the fact that Let's look at it. When you get down to Water Street, it's already crowded with the buses all stacked up. And if you had them running every 15 minutes, where in the world are you going to put them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think they would be all down Water Street at the same time. Um, you know, they would figure out. A, I, I, I think that actual uh, there needs to be more than one transit hub. 
I think Albemarle County needs a transit hub. Um, you know, we've got all these big shopping centers uh, that are empty, and I would love to see a transit hub on the north end of town that could get people to the airport, that could get people to the UVA Research Park, that could get people to UVA if they're workers, or people could leave their car, even if they drew, drove to the transit hub and hop on bus rapid transit to some of these centers, and I think we could make better use of some of these uh, empty shopping malls. Um, and then you then you can build services around that. You know, if you take your car to the transit hub and, and you're um, heading to UVA, you could, you know, order dinner at a restaurant right near the transit hub, pick it up, put it in your car, take it home. Um, you know, you can begin to envision services around it. Um, that would be great. So I would love to see, you know, a hub outside of downtown for transit. What a great idea. Mm -hmm. Lots of great Fingers ideas crossed. here. Maybe someday <laughs> we'll get there. Fashion Square Mall. <laughs> <laughs> or even um, the one on the north side of Rio that's so empty, although I think it's something's going in there now. I'm not sure. It looks like mm -hmm. it's being built out. But. Yeah, it's a new grocery store. I'm not loved to, I don't have to ride the bus to that grocery store. I can walk there, but yeah, that'd be a great location. I mean, there was transit in there. Uh, you know, back in the day, but no longer. Hmm. Yeah, and then you could go grocery shopping before you hop in your car and go home, yeah. right? There, there is um, significant talk of adding a transit hub um, at that uh, the twenty nine Rio intersection, perhaps when they redo the um, shopping center where ACAC is located. It's still just on the wish list, but it's part of the Rio twenty nine small area plan to develop such a transit hub there. That would be awesome. Yes, it would. I'm all for it. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was also a comment from Ben. I'd love to see a railroad line between Charlottesville and Richmond one day, just to. Yeah, I think um, there was actually a big transit deal, uh, rail deal that was announced in the state of Virginia, Northam announced with uh, Secretary Buttigieg um, more from central Virginia to DC. So hopefully we'll get there. Um, you know, I was listening to actually it wasn't even a climate podcast, but um, it was a, a guy who moved here from England and he now has this podcast uh, lost in the pond or something like that. And it's all about uh, understanding American culture from a British perspective. And he said the thing he missed most about um, living in Europe was the um, just the fast trains where you can get where you want to go um, and that that it's just crazy that you can't travel in the United States that way so well thank you so much Susan and C3 and thank you all for attending and all your activism and input this has been a tremendous yeah. experience for me so thank you and uh, we did record it and eventually we'll put it on our website as well so um, you can share that with others thank you all and thank you carolyn for hosting and um, all of you for your great insights and input i really appreciate the conversation it's helpful to me